There was a time in the early days of Willie Nelson's career that he owned his own golf course. And someone asked him what par was for his course, and he said, par is anything you want it to be. He said, you see that hole over there? He said, that's a par 47, and yesterday I birdied it. <laughs> now, we may chuckle at that, but it is a good illustration of the way many, if not most, people today approach the truth. Truth is whatever we want it to be. Everything, of course, has become totally relative. Everyone has their own version of the truth, and they want us to accept their version of the truth as just as valid as any other. The concept of truth has become as clouded as a par 47 hole. But you and I know that there is, in fact, absolute authoritative truth, and it is found in God's Word. His truth is non-negotiable. It is not open for interpretation. It is not customizable to our own selfish whims. And we are commanded to earnestly contend for it. It has been once for all delivered to the saints, and we are responsible to guard it and protect it. As we continue to go through this epistle of Jude, when you get to verse 17, you'll notice there is a distinct turning point. Throughout this epistle so far, Jude has been characterizing the apostates. He has referred to certain persons who have crept in unnoticed. He's referred to them as these men in verse 8 and verse 10, as they in verse 11 and 12, as these in verse 14 and 16. But suddenly, when you get to verse 17, it says, but you. Now, there's going to be one more comment about these in verse 19, but then he's going to come back in verse 20 and say, but you you. Jude is clearly bringing this down to the application. He is going to explain to us how we are to live in the last days. He is going to admonish us in regard to how we are to deal with these apostates and how we are to live in a day of growing apostasy. But before we get to that, I need to go back to verse 16 for a moment because we didn't get to that verse last time. Verse 16 continues the characterization of the apostates. Look at it with me. These are grumblers finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. Before we move on to how to live in the last days, which is the title for today's message, let's spend just a little bit of time on the last verse of the previous section. Now, Jude has characterized these apostates in a lot of different ways. But now, in verse 16, he particularly looks at the sins of their mouths. He describes them by sins of speech. He says, first of all, they are grumblers. They're grumblers. It's an interesting Greek word there. It's the word gagustis. It means to murmur. It is a word that is used to describe the children of Israel in the wilderness as they murmured against Moses. In the Septuagint, It's used to describe someone who murmurs against God. And in essence, that's really what they were doing. They were complaining to God about not having anything to drink or anything to eat, et cetera, et cetera. 
in the New Testament, the Jews also murmured against God's provision of the bread of life. We read in John 6, 41, the Jews therefore were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were grumbling, same basic word, because they wanted physical bread, but he came to bring them spiritual bread. That's not what they wanted. So they grumbled against him. And as far as applying this to apostates, it has to do with the fact that they are grumblers against God's truth. They don't want what God has given. They have their own agenda. They are not content with the truth God has revealed to us in his word. They want something new and novel and entertaining that appeals to the flesh, so they turn to other things. They turn away from the truth of God to other things. Jude also says they are fault finders. Now, that's another interesting Greek word. It's memsomorous. It means to blame, to blame. They're always blaming someone else. They're classic blame shifters. They're constant complainers. They're never happy with anything. And it's always someone else's fault. This word is used to describe someone who is always discontent and unsatisfied. And in particular here, they are not satisfied with God's revealed will. They're not satisfied with the truth God has given. They won't submit themselves to it. Peter wrote, because of them, the way of the truth is being maligned. They have to have something novel and new so they turn away from the truth. Then Jude says they are following after their own lusts. That's the inner motivation behind their sins of speech. And we saw earlier they are dominated by self. They want what they want when they want it. They're driven by the sinful nature of the unredeemed flesh. As a result, they speak arrogantly. This is the word Hooper agkas, it means of excessive weight or size. The New King James has, they mouth great swelling words, overinflated words. The ESV says they are loudmouthed boasters. Their focus is all on themselves, and therefore they're always talking about themselves, and they do it with great swelling words of self-exaltation. They puff themselves up in their own minds, and their boasting reveals their self-centered focus. And then finally, Jude says, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. This means they tell people what they want to hear in order to profit personally. The two words translated flattering people in the New American Standard literally means to marvel the face. In other words, they put on a good show that leaves people in wonder and they uh, gravitate toward the spectacular but their motivation is personal profits, personal gain. These are the faith healers. These are the health, wealth, and prosperity gurus. They put on this impressive show so that people who are watching will send in money. And of course, they tell people exactly what they want to hear as long as the coffers are filled. Jude was describing really today's televangelists to a T. 
And with this further characterization in mind, let's move now to verse 17 in this new section in which Jude gives us some instructions on how to live in the last days. We're going to see here what true believers should do in response to this threat in the church. The contrast is clearly seen in the phrase, but you. In contrast to the apostates, what are true believers to do? And we'll see this all the way down to verse 23, and then that great benediction at the end. What does Jude say to genuine believers? Look again at verse 17. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last time there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. Jude is saying that when apostates come into the church and they begin to teach false doctrine and to pervert the faith, the true believers should remember something. That's a key word in that verse. The real Christians need to remember that all of this has been predicted. The apostles of Christ warned that this would happen. And remember now, the Holy Spirit revealed a lot of things to the apostles and they wrote them all down and that became what we now call the New Testament. There are all kinds of prophecies that are given by the various writers of the New Testament. For example, by the apostle John in the book of Revelation about future events such as uh, the tribulation period, the rapture of the church, the millennial reign of Christ, and many other things. But along with all that, the Holy Spirit also revealed to the apostles that there would be a great turning away from the faith at the end of the age. And yes, the Bible indicates that there will be apostasy all throughout the history of the church, but we're told that it will be greatly intensified as the end of the church age approaches. And we see that very clearly in the epistles of Paul, Peter, John, and now Jude. In fact, we really see that from nearly every writer in the New Testament. So what Jude is saying here is that anytime we as genuine believers in Christ, as those who are committed to the true faith that has been once for all delivered to the saints, anytime we get concerned about the perversion of sound doctrine and the distortion of the gospel by false teachers, we need to remember that this is something that has been clearly prophesied by the apostles of our Lord. This is something that is supposed to happen. It is all part of God's plan. So we shouldn't get all bent out of shape or discouraged or fearful when we hear about apostasy. We should just stay faithful to God's truth and continue to boldly proclaim it, and then trust God to carry out his plan. We have been told in Scripture, there are going to be mockers. There are going to be mockers who make fun of us. There are going to be those who rebel against the clear teaching of Scripture. There are going to be those who outright reject it. There are going to be many who will twist it and distort it. There are also going to be those who, because of their ungodly lusts, are going to tell people what they want to hear and pander to the lust of the flesh and portray a prosperity gospel which includes all kinds of ear-tickling stuff. We're told that. So we shouldn't be shocked when that happens. We shouldn't be surprised when that happens. 
because this is what Paul said, and this is what Peter said, and this is what John said, and this is now what Jude is saying. In fact, just 25 years after Jude wrote this little epistle, the apostle John on the island of Patmos wrote the letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Of those seven churches, five of them had become infested with false doctrine. John MacArthur writes, the Ephesian church had left its first love. The church at Pergamos is full of corruption, immorality, and heresy. The church at Thyatira is so wicked that the Lord threatens to kill some of them. The Sardis church is totally dead, murdered by apostates who defected from the church and from the truth. And then there is that famous Laodicean church that makes the Lord so sick, so nauseous that he says he's going to vomit them out of his mouth. We see this very early on. This is, of course, after the time of Jude, but even before this time, Paul had already warned the church of the danger of apostasy and had called the church back to sound doctrine. In Ephesians chapter 20, he had warned the Ephesian elders, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And then he said, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Paul knew that as soon as he left, these false teachers would begin to move in. And historically, of course, that's what happened. He warned young Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.13 that evil men and imposters would proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. He said in 2 Timothy 4.3, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they'll turn away their ears from the truth and they'll turn aside to myths. And we could go to many, many passages similar to this because there are many warnings of apostasy all throughout the New Testament. Let me just take you to a couple more Turn with me for a moment to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Second Corinthians 11, look with me at verse 13. Notice what it says here. And Paul is referring here to those who have been attacking him. And he says... For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. Paul says it shouldn't surprise us that these false prophets disguise themselves as workers of righteousness because Satan does the very same thing and parades himself as an angel of light. So this tells us there were already false teachers in the church at Corinth in the days of Paul. In Colossians 2.16, we're informed that there were also some in the church of Colossae at this time. And there we read, therefore let 
No one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Paul is talking here about the Judaizers who were trying to pervert the gospel by adding to it. But he goes on to say, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. Paul warned of those who are going to uh, delight themselves in self-abasement. They're going to exalt themselves. They're going to talk about the worship of angels. They're going to take a stand on visions they supposedly had seen. And rather than holding fast to Christ, the head, They're going to go off on their own. Now, we know that Paul was not the only one who warned about apostasy. We know that Peter also warned about this in 2 Peter 2, which really is kind of a corollary passage to uh, that one that we find in Jude. So turn with me just a moment to 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2. We looked at this one earlier, but it's worth going back to. 2 Peter 2, and look with me at verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Now, we spent some time on that previously. We'll come back to it. The Apostle John also had a lot to say about apostates in his epistles. And, of course, we just went through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. But just as a reminder, 1st John 2.19 says, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they all are not of us. These are the apostates. These are not genuine believers. They go out, and as they leave the church and they depart from the faith, they show they're not really born again. In 2 John 1, 7, he says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. We spent a lot of time on that. So what's the message? The message is don't be surprised when apostasy happens. Don't be shocked. In fact, the Bible says this is going to happen. There's going to be apostasy. There are going to be false teachers in the church. And we're seeing exactly that in our day and time. Really, when you look, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in bookstores. It's on Christian TV. You you can't turn on the TV and not, not see it. But we also need to remember there is always a remnant. There's always a remnant. There's always a core of true believers that are committed to the true faith. There are always genuine believers who stick with the truth of Scripture. In fact, That's why we so much need this call to arms here in Jude. We need to earnestly contend 
for the body of truth that makes up sound doctrine. But now I want to go back to verse 18, go back to Jude, and note an important phrase there in verse 18. Look again with me at verse 18. In the last time, there will be mockers. Now what I want to point out here is that this phrase has a general meaning and a specific meaning. Technically, theologically, the phrase, the last time, has to do with the entire church age. It has to do with the time in between Messiah's first coming and his second coming. So we could say that there is going to be apostasy all throughout the entire church age. That is the general sense. And we know from history this is what has happened. There have always been false teachers in the church. There have always been those who have brought heresy into the church and perverted sound doctrine. But I believe we also need to see this phrase as referring to something more specific. And that is, it points to the fact that as the time of Jesus' second coming approaches, apostasy is be going to come much more pervasive, much more pervasive. In fact, in fact, Paul addresses a time of great apostasy in connection with the return of Christ in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. He says that the day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And there may be some merit in seeing the church at the very end of the age of grace as being characterized by the church of Laodicea, which was a totally dead and unregenerate church. But the Bible indicates there's going to be a great falling away from the true faith at the end of the church age. And we very well may be in those days. If that is the case, this message from Jude is so very important. We need to heed the command of this passage to remember these things. And Jude is saying here, whatever apostates may do or say, don't be deceived by them. Hold on to the revelation of God that has been authored by the apostles and those affiliated with them. Stick with the truth of the New Testament because this is what is going to anchor you in the last days. This is what is going to provide you security against false doctrine and false teaching. And going back to verse 17, remembering is one of the most important elements in Christianity. It's in the imperative form here. This is a command. Make sure you remember. And listen, the way forward in the Christian life is not by some modern innovation. It's not through some kind of new revelation from God. It is that of recalling what has already been revealed through the apostles of Christ. That's what the Christian life is all about. In fact, the truth is, if it's new, it's not true. If it's new, it's not true. If it's not in conformity to that which has been once for all delivered to the saints through the apostles and those affiliated with them, it is false doctrine and it must be rejected. This is a clear message from Jude. And we need to remember all the sound doctrine that has already been revealed to us through the apostles of Christ. And we need to remember that the apostles predicted that apostasy would come. And in light of this, we need to do three things. Three things. And this is going to be our outline for the rest of today and for probably a couple more weeks. We need to do three things. First of all, 
we need to be informed about who the apostate is, what he does, and why he does it. We need to be informed. Secondly, we need to be insulated by keeping ourselves in the love of God. And then thirdly, we need to be impeccable in our witness to a world without Christ. So with the time that we have remaining, which is just a few minutes, let's kind of go through these one at a time. And the first thing we need to do is we need to be informed. Informed. We need to be informed regarding three big questions about apostates. We need to know who they are, we need to know what they do, and we need to know why they do it. Every true believer should be informed regarding these three questions. Who, what, and why. So very quickly, let's spend just a little bit of time on each one. We're not going to get all the way through this today, but we'll at least get started. First, we need to be informed of their identity. That's the who. And you may be thinking, well, but pastor... uh, You know, that's been what this whole epistle has been explaining. I mean, Jude has been characterizing these guys all the way through this. And he's used illustrations from Old Testament history. And he's used illustrations from the world of nature. Really, that's all we've seen. Yes, that's true. But in 18, verse 18, he brings this all down to one final summary. Look at verse 18. In the last time, there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. And here, Jude is obviously quoting 2 Peter because this is almost verbatim what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3.3. In fact, turn with me again there just quickly. 2 Peter 3.3. These two passages are corollaries. We need to be ready to compare one with the other. Peter says, no, (coughs) this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust. Almost identical to what Jude says. These are the only two places in the New Testament where the word mockers is used. So it's pretty clear Jude is quoting Peter as a representative of the apostles. And it also tells us that 2 Peter was written before Jude. And again, the word for mockers there is an interesting word in the Greek language. It means to act in a childish fashion, to be childish, to play, to make fun of, or to make light of. And by the way, this term is closely associated with the unpardonable sin that is described in Matthew 12, 31 and 32, where it says, therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the spirit shall not be forgiven. And whoever shall speak a word against the son of man, it shall be forgiven him, but whoever shall speak against Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. The sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is tantamount to making light of his witness concerning Christ and therefore rejecting salvation by grace through faith in him. But in the case Jude is referring to, apostates are those who make light of the word of God. They make fun of God's word. They're mockers who belittle the truth that God has revealed. They reject its authority over their lives, but instead they pursue their own lusts. They do not want a God to whom they are accountable. They want to follow their own way and pursue their own goals and their own passions so they distort the truth to justify their sin. This is why we need to be clear as to who these people are. But secondly, we also need to be informed of their intent. That's the what. That's the what. Look at verse 19. 
These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. What do they do? Well, first, they're sensual in their behavior. The word for worldly-minded there can be translated sensual. So once again, we see where apostasy and sensuality are linked together in Scripture. As Jude has said, they have turned the grace of God into licentiousness, just like those in Sodom who gave themselves over to gross immorality. They have indulged the flesh. They have foamed up their own shame. They have done ungodly deeds. They have followed their own ungodly lusts. So we really should not be surprised at all when there is scandal involving immorality in the church, when there are false prophets. Because what you have here really is a religious person who has no ability to control the flesh because he's never truly been born again. In fact, Jude says they're devoid of the Spirit. They don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit in their life to provide, first of all, a new nature, and secondly, the power to overcome sin. So, of course, they're going to be controlled by their lusts, just as those who don't even make a claim to be a Christian. But it's interesting that the word for worldly-minded there in verse 19 is the Greek word psukikos, from where we get our English word psychology. It basically means soulish. Now, some want to use this to justify a tripartite view of man that we are body, soul, and spirit. And I may do a a message or two on that to clarify that. But to the Greeks, this was an aspect of physical being. The word pneuma is the word that is used to describe the inner man. This was part of the outer man, the sukikos. But it's interesting that another translation of the word sukikos is the word natural. And Paul often made the distinction between the natural man and the spiritual man. In other words, between the unregenerate man and the regenerate man. And we see that very clearly in 1 Corinthians 2.14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. A lost person can't understand spiritual truth. And it's really interesting that the translators of the New American Standard have the word worldly minded here because this is really referring to someone who's lost. They are worldly minded because they're unregenerate, they're not spiritual. They're natural. And he says they are devoid of the Spirit. They've never experienced true spiritual regeneration. So all they're left with really is a soulish life, devoid of the Spirit. All they, they're left with psychology. That's all. They don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. As a result of that, what do they do? They cause divisions. They cause divisions. Now, this is what they do, but this doesn't mean what you might think it means. They're divisive, of course. They they cause divisions in the church, but this is more than just the effect here. The verb is apodirizo, and this is the only time it's used in the New Testament. It literally means to separate or to make a distinction. And the idea here is that they separate themselves and they distinguish themselves above the rest. They're like the Pharisees in Jesus' day. They believe they are superior to everyone else. So they separate themselves into their own holy huddle. The derivation of the word for Pharisee is a Hebrew word that means to separate. And like the Pharisees, these apostates are those who divide themselves off from the rest. 
They believe they have arrived at the truth and that everyone else is ignorant. So they have elevated themselves on a pedestal as the elite. They have made a separation from everyone else. They scoff at the simpletons in the church. They're condescending. They're much not like the Gnostics who would come along later who would believe that they have some kind of secret knowledge that no one else had. Diotrephes may have been one of these because he's described in Scripture as one who loved to have the preeminence. He wanted to be seen as elevated above everybody else. So what is being described here is an attitude of the false teachers that is arrogant and condescending, and they're scoffing at those in the church who are taking the Bible literally. They're categorizing true believers as those who are non-intelligent simpletons. Does that sound familiar? There is much of that attitude in our day and time. And so the false teachers have their big show and then they hop on their private plane and they fly to their mansion and separate themselves from everyone else. Well, I think this is a good place to stop here this morning. We'll pick it up right here next time. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would help us to be diligent Help us to guard the truth. Help us to know the truth so well that we're not deceived in any way. We thank you that you have given us your truth. It's your written word. And Lord, we thank you that you have preserved it miraculously through time. And we have it and we know it's reliable. And we can stand on it. We can build our lives and our eternity upon it. But Lord, help us to remain committed to it. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this place today that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they would come to know you in your saving grace. Lord, I pray that all of us would respond to you and your word in the way that you would want us to today. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, have some elders here at the front uh, at the conclusion of our service. And of course, they're here to help you if you need to receive Christ today, if you need uh, to make some kind of public uh, commitment this morning, they're here to help you, aid you in that. Uh, Maybe you need to be a part of this church family. Maybe you need to follow in baptism. Maybe you need a word of counsel or prayer. As always, these men will be available to help you with that. Well, it's a joy to have you with us today, and especially our our guests who are with us. Hope that you uh, enjoyed being here this morning. Hope that you feel welcome, that you'll come back and be with us again. Hope that you'll just uh, come back and be here with us tonight for our evening service. Pastor John's going to be continuing his series on the Trinity, and uh, you'll want to be in for that. Well, let's stand together, and Pastor Michael's coming to lead us as we sing.